Welcome to the Broken Phoenix Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Allen. I hope you've been enjoying it these last two episodes. I get a little passionate talking about certain things. I've had some people give me some feedback and they're like, oh man, you're swearing a lot. And I gave you that warning on social media and I thought about it as I was editing. I even cut out some of the words, but figured, you know what? I'm going to leave them in because this is authentically me. And some of the stuff I talk about, I get a little passionate about. So if you know me, you know, that's how I talk. And if it's too brazen for you, that's fine. Find something else. Because we're going to talk about real things here. But I hope you've been able to take something from them. That's the whole point of this. Whoever's listening, hopefully it helps you in some aspect. I say enjoy. Because... We got to make light of the situation, no matter how hard it is. So it goes back to the whole laugh of my, my pain. So with that, here's episode three, trigger warning for those getting ready to listen. If you haven't read the title yet, it's to talk about suicide and why we should choose to live. I know it's a difficult topic for a lot of people to talk about. It's end of life, right? And death is really hard for a lot of people, for everybody for that matter. And suicide is such a crazy ideology to some people. Can't quite grasp it. And I used to be like that too. I've highlighted in both episodes how my uncle committed suicide. Though I wasn't extremely close to him, I always liked him. He was always nice to me, personal to me. And I remember going hunting with him that year and my dad and everything seemed fine. And a couple months later, he committed suicide. So with that, the intro to this one, I want to talk about a friend and their write-up on their thoughts of experimenting with suicide. So this is what they wrote. Cloudy. Gray. Isolated. Lonely. There have been three times during this particular year that this friend fell into a deep depressive state. They typically lasted two and a half to three days, the depressive thoughts, that is. All were difficult to navigate, but the last one was the most difficult. There was no rhyme or reason. Motivation was lacking as they laid in bed No energy to do laundry or other chores. They didn't feel like cleaning the house. Anything. Hobbies felt like they didn't exist. They felt lifeless. Or like a zombie. Just existing. Empty inside. This is when the thoughts began. They started to weigh the pros and cons of suicide. Pro, the pain, anxiety, stress, and loneliness would cease to exist. They wouldn't have to feel it anymore. The weight on their shoulders, constantly slaying dragons and swimming out of the deep end, getting out of the surf. Pro, no longer be a burden to people. It'd be like taking stress away from others. Be like you're handing them a gift that they don't have to help navigate their trauma as well. Con, it only took one. They imagine someone telling their children what happened and how they let them down. What a selfish act, right? 
What type of a legacy would that leave? They pictured their children sobbing and a lifelong mental impact it would have on them. After shedding some tears, they got out of bed to do anything to get them out of the deep end. They decided to go strength train or trauma train as they commonly referred to it. If you haven't guessed it, his friend's name is Zach Allen. That's right. I once contemplated suicide. I'm not proud of it, and I was very embarrassed. I remember that day. I went to the weight room. I did some cardio. And I thought to myself as I was listening to another podcast, I was like, man, did I really just think about quitting? And I was in a dark spot, man. I was so embarrassed. That's not my mindset. And people that know me, I've had countless people reach out and they're like, you're the strongest person I know physically and mentally. For those that don't know me well, I'm a strength and conditioning coach and 250 pounds and all that stuff. So I'm a relatively stronger guy in the grand scheme of things. That's not me boasting. I don't think I'm that strong overall, but that's just my inner voice being hard on me as well. But anyways, I did. I legit contemplated it. That was the one time in life. Because after everything that was hitting personally, again, trauma after trauma after trauma. And I just got into a funk. But I forced myself. I forced myself to get the hell out of bed. And I found that that helped a lot. Do something. Get up and strength train. Go for a walk. Get outside. Go bowling. Axe throwing. Shoot guns. Whatever you got to do. Get your mind out of that funk. Get out there and get after it. So enough of that sad talk. Move on here a little bit. I want to talk about some statistics here with suicide. Briefly highlight them. Suicide is way more common than what it's talked about. CDC reports that it's increased approximately 36% between 2000 and 2021. In 2021, there were 48,183 deaths associated with suicide. That equates about one death every 11 minutes. The American Addiction Centers highlights veterans. In 2020, there were 6,146 vet suicides. That's approximately 16.8 vets a day. People that contemplate suicide, it's even higher. 12.3 million American adults. 3.5 million planned suicide attempts and 1.7 million attempted. In 2021, top nine leading cause of death for ages eight to 64, and second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 14 and 20 to 34. Ethnic groups that affects the most. Highest rate is non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Native people followed by non-Hispanic white people, other Americans with higher than average rates of suicide or veterans. Also young people who identify as gay, lesbian, trans, or bisexual have a higher prevalence of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Why is that? There's a ton of reasons, ton of reasons that I've found that I've experienced personally But next we'll talk about some causes and precursors and some prevention. What causes suicidal thoughts, man? The whole gauntlet of things. I'm gonna read some off to you here. 
And I'm sure that everybody that's listening has experienced one of these. Most often you feel like you can't cope with stress or an overwhelming life situation. That's a big cause of it. That was mine. This feels like the only way out, man. Every time you come up out of the water, you get a breath in the deep end. Some dragon comes and hits you and knocks you back in. Again and again and again. And you're just sick of it, man. There also may be a genetic link to it. Those who contemplate suicide or have thoughts are more likely to have a family history of suicide. My therapist mentioned that in past research, she doesn't know quite what it is now, but in the past they showed about a 60% risk of suicide for children if a loved one completed it. And without me even knowing that statistic, that ran through my mind and that's what got me out of it. Again, what legacy do you want to leave to your children? That was enough for me, and thankfully it was. Some risk factors are previous attempts, feeling hopeless, loss of loved ones, military service, a breakup, financial problems, legal problems, substance abuse, psychiatric disorders such as depression, PTSD, or bipolar disorder. Family history of mental disorders, sexual abuse, being lesbian or gay, and not having support from family, which creates hostile environments. Children and teens don't diminish their stressful life events, whether it's a loss of a loved one, loss or conflict with a friend or family. When they experience this stuff, if your child or a child or a teenager comes to you to seek comfort, if they had a fight with their friend Becky or, you know, little Johnny called me fat in school and it really upset me, don't take the route of saying, well, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you, things like that. Don't diminish how much it affected them. I've had that done to me whenever I was younger. It didn't feel great. I've done it to my kids in the past because I just, again, thought, well, I'll just be tough all the time. Now through this journey, I listen to them. I just shut the hell up and I listen to them. Funny thing is my daughter, whenever we got our first snowstorm here, she built a snowman. And the next time I got her, you know, weather warmed up a little bit and it started melting. And man, she threw a fit, started bawling, said it was her only best friend, ran to her room crying. I stayed in the kitchen. I laughed at myself a little bit because I use that as a metaphor to some people when I'm busting their chops. I'll say things like, oh, what happened? Did your snowman melt? Feeling, feeling a little bad today? And I'm just busting my friend's chops. But... I let her take a minute or two to cry and I went in there and I consoled her then. I said, honey, it'll be okay. We'll get some more snow. We'll build another snowman. It's fine. It's not your only friend. You have me, you have your brothers, you have your friends at school, basketball team, all that stuff. She continued to cry a little bit and I just hugged her. Old me would have been like, get over it. It's okay. You can build another one. It's fine. Toughen up. I do say toughen up after they're done crying and have felt their emotions because I think that is the balance that we need. I don't care if you agree with me with that or not. I think you need to find that fine balance between consoling and let you feel in it for the five minutes. But then you do need to toughen up because guess what? Life is going to come back at you and you need to be resilient. No matter what you think your kids are going through, whether it's so small and trivial to you, let them feel it, man. And let them process it so they can be better in the future and not make a bunch of mistakes that you made. Also with children, physical or sexual abuse, becoming pregnant, 
getting an STI or bullying. Man, I wish I could eradicate all that stuff, which I know probably 100% of my listeners think that as well. The last bits there that I just mentioned. Mainly the physical and sexual abuse and the bullying. I wish we could say, man, just be better people. But some people just aren't hardwired that way. They're just assholes. And they're just bad people. There are monsters that do exist out there. Be as vigilant as you can. But whenever someone in your life becomes a survivor of those things, support them. Be there for them. Through therapy, I remember talking and my therapist used to do some social work stuff. And it made me rethink how I talk to my kids, particularly my daughter. And she talked about how this one little girl that she helped rescue was being abused by a neighbor for years. Physically or physically and sexually abused. And they asked her why she didn't say anything to her parents, you know. And she turned and looked at him and said, because one time my daddy said, if anybody ever touched me like that, that he would kill them. And I didn't want my daddy to go to prison and not see him again. That changed my whole outlook <laughs> on how I address my kids now with that type of stuff. I changed how I talked to my daughter if like things like that would happen. You know, now I don't say, oh, if anybody ever touched you, you know, I'd kill him. I just say, if anything ever would happen, if anybody would mistreat you, just tell dad. And then we'll, we'll talk to them. You know, obviously I'd report it to the authorities and things like that. But I want my kids to feel comfortable coming and talking to me. Because I'd rather them cry on my shoulder. And then we get them the help that we need to get them as opposed to having a big picture up on an easel of their face and seeing everybody cry and everybody wearing black and getting ready to bury them because they just couldn't handle it. So don't diminish your children and the stressful events that happen in their lives either. So be a good person. Move on, prevention. This can be 100% preventable. It can be. Is it? No. Again, some mental disorders, is just some people just can't overcome it. Treat the underlying cause. Try not to feel embarrassed reaching out for help. Sort of sounds hypocritical of me to say, because whenever I began experiencing some hardships in the last couple of years, I was embarrassed to reach out for help. I don't need therapy. I give therapy, you know, with my profession. I don't need therapy. It's embarrassing. I don't need help with this. I know enough leadership stuff and mindsets and things like that. I was an idiot, man. So stupid. But I felt embarrassed, so I get it. But I'm telling you, put your pride aside for those that are listening. It's worth it. You may feel embarrassed at first, but those that truly give a shit about you are going to let you know that you're not alone and they got your back. Establish a support network. Funny, that's what my previous episode is about. Episode two. Friends, family, therapy. Those are your support network. Lean on them. Remember, you're going to feel like a burden. But trust me, those that truly care about you will let you know that you're not a burden. And they will always be there to support you. So reach out to them. Put your pride aside. Reach out. And support people. Be sure not to judge them for sure. Even if deep down you're like, oh, here we go. Here's that calling again, man. What bullshit's he going to spit now? To hear him moan and groan and cry and all this stuff. 
it's hard to hold, hold this fire hydrant up and while well, he's sobbing. The silverback gorilla, sick of wiping his tears and hearing him yell, which none of my support people have ever done. Again, I've mentioned that before and I'll keep reiterating that as long as it takes, but just support people. If these people come to you with even stuff that you don't think is like that huge of a deal. Again, just be supportive. Sometimes you just need to let them vent and not give any feedback at all. Remember, these thoughts are temporary. Life will get better. Keep slaying dragons. Keep relying on your support system. Find another purpose and figure out what grounds you. Again, you get lost in these deep thoughts. And you need to get out of the funk. You need to get moving and do something. So refer to your support people with me. But always remember, this stuff is temporary. It doesn't have to break you. Stay in the fight. So, what's something we can do about it? Here's the Phoenix perspective. I want to discuss sensory meditation or the 54321 method. Got this from the Calm app. I remember I was going through the shit some one time and I was trying to think of something else, some other type of meditation. Because I was using general stuff, breathing techniques, closing my eyes, all that stuff. But I'm like, something, it's just not working right now. I need something else. I stumbled upon this sensory meditation. It's a grounding technique used to manage stress and reduce anxiety. And it did help me in the moment. So me being a person that needs something specific, like I hate when people are vague and they're just like, yeah, just meditate. Okay, what's that mean? Give me some steps. Give me a blueprint. What the hell do I need to do, man? Breathing, do I need to cross my legs? Do I need to balance on one leg and touch my nose and whatever? Give me something specific. So I found this specific method. So the five, four, three, two, one method goes like this. Look at five things you can see right in front of you. Four things you can touch. Three things you can hear. Two things you can smell. And one thing you can taste. It gets you away from the what ifs of life. And it grounds you back to the present. What's right in front of you right now. So I did that. I was laying there. It's okay. Okay. I can see a picture frame. I can see the TV. I can see the blue walls. I can see my backpack over there in the corner. I can see my kids toys Four things you touch. Okay. I can touch my beard. I can touch this glass of orange juice that I have. I can touch this pillow that I'm laying on. I can touch the wooden floor. Three things you can hear. I can hear my kids yelling. And I can also see them swinging from chandeliers and things like that. I can hear the cars going up and down the road out in front of my house. I can hear Bluey playing on the TV. And the jingle stuck in your head forever. Two things you can smell. I can smell the orange juice in my glass. I can smell my kid's breath as I get in my face and say, Daddy, Daddy, can I have a snack? And one thing you can taste, I can taste the orange juice. Or I can taste gum that I'm chewing on, anything. And it sounds so simple, but man, it just distracts your mind right then and there. And you're like, okay, right here I am. I'm in the present. It takes you out of that funk. You'll sit there and you'll start thinking of the what ifs. What if I would have done this? What if I would have done that? What if this happens to me? And you start getting distracted in the moment with what's in front of you and you ground it back to the present. Like, oh, I'm right here, right now. I'm not in 2021. I'm not in 2022. I'm not in 2032. I'm right here. 
It interrupts the fight or flight response and calms the nervous system. That method has helped me before and I hope it helps you as well moving forward. That's just one specific tool. Again, there's other tools out there that can help get you out of the funk in that moment in time. Again, another one, reach out to your people. If you're feeling it in that moment, I'm guilty. That's one of the worst things about me. I've had all four of my people tell me, reach out to me if you're feeling down, even my therapist. And she gives me shit all the time too. Say, I know you're not going to reach out, but call me because there's some things that happen throughout the week before our next session that are going to bug you. And you don't have to do this alone, dumbass. You're right. You're right. So I need to get better with that as well. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I'll hold myself accountable. I'll follow my sword so I don't die by a thousand lashings of yours. I will hold myself accountable too, and I will do better. Leave it with a couple quotes and some mindsets. Marcus Aurelius wrote in Meditations that you can leave life right now. Let that determine what you do, say, and think. Also, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Therefore, guard accordingly. Take care that you entertain no notions unsuitable to virtue and reasonable nature. Charles Swindle said he likes to think attitude is 10% what happens to him and 90% how he reacts to it. And I've used that quote since I worked at Michigan State. I love that quote. I have to remind myself of it often. Because sometimes, man, sometimes I get caught up and feeling sorry for myself a little bit. Playing the victim mindset. Like, nope, I don't have to think like this, man. This person did this to me, or they think of me in this light. You know, their opinion of me is none of my business. I don't give a shit. Move on. Change your mindset. Memento mori. It's Latin for remember, you will die. Also, one of my favorite quotes by Maximus Decimus Meridius. My, one of my favorite movies, Gladiator, to which my oldest son is partially named after as well. What we do in life echoes in eternity. It goes back to the legacy you want to leave, man. How do you want your children to view you? Or others that are so important in your life, how do you want them to view you? You know, you're given a short little bit on this earth, man. Use it. Don't waste it. You don't have to end it. Gather the right people around you. Find your purpose and what grounds you. And you can get through the suck. You can slay the dragons. You can surf that big wave. You can get out of the deep end whenever you want to. Nothing's holding you there at the end of the day other than your own mind. Callous that mind and push forward. If you're having thoughts, suicide, call 988 or text it or go to 988lifeline.org or reach out to your people. That's a free service, by the way, totally anonymous. Put your pride aside and stay there for the people that love you and care about you. They want you here. Again, they'd rather hold you and listen to you sob. It doesn't matter if you're 6'5 and 270 pounds or 5'4 and 170 pounds. They would rather hear you sob and hold you and wipe the tears off your face than go to your funeral and cry over your casket. I promise you that. Stay in the fight, never ever give up, and have the day you deserve. Until next time.